life in, in a number of different ways, and uh, maybe a little different approach to his life this morning. But uh, look at Luke chapter 22, and starting with verse 31, I'll just read down to verse 34. Verse 31 in chapter 22, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he, the Lord, said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Did you know that the devil knows you better than you know yourself? Sometimes we think as men we know ourselves pretty well. We kind of know how we're going to react in certain situations. We know what we like. We know what we dislike. Uh, we, we think that we know ourselves pretty well, but I don't think we know ourselves as well as the devil knows us. In 2 Corinthians 2, in verse 11, Paul said, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I read that verse and I think, yeah, I know oftentimes where the devil is going to tempt me, but I don't always pay attention to it. In other words, I, I know there are some areas in my life that the devil has perhaps a little more access to or I'm a little more vulnerable to, but oftentimes I don't put up those defense systems like I ought to. And Peter, toward the end of his life, says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The word devour there means to make to disappear. Now, we found out last night, we can't lose our salvation, but we can sure lose our testimony. And the devil wants nothing more than to make our testimony disappear. Uh, he's working really hard at it right now. You know, you think about how the devil is trying to make the influence of the church in America to disappear. He's trying to, trying to get Christians to a place where they have no influence, where Christianity has no impact on the world. That's the devil's goal in your life individually that your life would have no impact on your family or how your children turn out. That your life would have no impact on your brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. Your life would have no impact on the lost around you that need Christ. So the devil is constantly at work roaming around this world as the prince and power of the air to try to get our testimony to disappear. So are we taking that seriously? During World War II, it is said that General Patton, who was the leader of our Allied forces in World War II, he kept two books on his nightstand and read from them every night. Two books. The first was the Bible. Now, I don't know if George Patton was a Christian. <laughs> a lot of things that came out of his mouth would indicate he probably wasn't. But on the other hand, he, he did read from the Bible every night, and when asked why he read from the Bible each day, he said, well, the Bible is a book of wisdom, and as a leader, I need wisdom, and I don't know a greater book to go to than, than to learn wisdom. Well, certainly, he was correct in that thinking, was he not? I mean, wisdom comes from God, and so Patton read from the Bible to get wisdom. The other book that he kept on his nightstand, read from every night, was a book entitled Rummel's Rules of War. Well, who was Rummel? Well, Rummel was the general of Hitler's army. And he had written a book on the strategies of war. And so Patton would read from that enemy playbook every night because he wanted to understand how his enemy was going to attack or how they were going to respond to what he would do. I was thinking this morning, there's a lot of offensive coordinators in the NFL that are spending their entire day today studying defenses. Because you can have a great offense, but if you don't know what defense they're in, you're not going to be successful tomorrow, right? So as a Christian, yes, we have to study the Word of God. We have to get God's mind. We have to understand the truth. But at the same time as men, we better be aware of how the devil is attacking us. We better be aware of what his devices are. Do you know those areas of vulnerability in your life? Do you know those areas of weakness where Satan could capitalize in your life? 
I, when I think about the Apostle Peter, I would have to come to a conclusion that Peter was a, a fairly strong man. Peter was a leader type. Peter was a type A personality. Peter was the kind of guy that wanted to get something done. After all, when the Lord found Peter, he was a fisherman. Uh, he had a business going there. He obviously was somewhat successful. He had already been married when the Lord called him. As far as we know, he's the only disciple that was married. He probably was the most mature in the sense of age than any of the disciples. So Peter was sort of one of these self-made men, a businessman, strong, got to make it happen, self-employed. You know, he's got he's to do it. Nobody else is going to do it for him. So Peter is a, a strong individual, a, a self-made person, someone with a little bit of experience. But Peter struggled, it appears, with honesty about his weaknesses. As strong men, we tend to do that. We tend to highlight our strengths but cover up our weakness. We tend to deny our weaknesses. We tend to say, well, you know, I'm a man. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter that I've got this thing over here, this problem over here that's constantly weighing me down, that, that's constantly keeping me from running my race because I can compensate over here in these areas of strength. And I think Peter, he, he tended to overlook those areas of vulnerability, and Satan exploited them time after time after time in his life. Remember, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before fall. We may think, well, I, I know myself, and I'm not going to let myself get, get taken. I'm not going to let myself get in trouble. But remember, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Do we really know how vulnerable we may be? As men, we think, well, I, I, I'll handle it when it comes. You know, if, I, if I'm making a mistake, if I'm not going the right direction, I'll, I'll plow through it somehow. I mean, I, 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 can, I, can, I can make it happen. When we, were, when we were living in Wisconsin, going to church there, we had a man in our church who was a truck driver. His name was Ed Feld. And our pastor had a tendency, whenever he greeted you, to say, how's it going? He'd say, hey, Mike, how's it going? Or he'd say, Hi, hey, John, how's it going? That's kind of the way he greeted you. And I remember walking to church one morning, and Ed uh, kind of came in about the same time, and Pastor said, hey, Brother Ed, how's it going? And Ed said, Pastor, if it ain't going, I got to get out and push. <laughs> and, you know, that's how we kind of think as men. You know, if we get stalled out, if, we, if something comes our way that's an obstacle or whatever, we, we can make it happen. I think about Samson. Samson was a man that had the Spirit of God upon his life even before he was born. And Samson was given this amazing strength. And nobody knew where that strength came from. I don't think Samson was a Herculean kind of look of a guy. I think he was just a normal person, but he had this amazing strength. Someone that could uh, catch 300 foxes. Someone that could take the gates of a city and, and walk away with them. Somebody that could, could uh, kill a lion with his bare hands. I mean, that's a guy that you kind of stand up and notice. Samson had this amazing divine strength upon his life, and, and yet he was under that Nazarite vow. But Samson thought, eh, I don't need that. And Samson began to play with that vow. And he began to get involved with the wrong kind of women. And, and it appears that he got involved with, with taking of the, of the vine. And he broke that Nazarite vow. And one day, as he laid in the lap of Delilah, his hair was shorn. After he told her the secret to his strength, that he was a Nazarite and not a razor had ever come to his head. She sheared that hair off. And then she awakened him by saying, Samson. The Philistines are upon thee. The Philistines are upon thee. And can you imagine as Samson awakens and sees that hair on the floor? And the Bible says he shook himself. And he said, I will go out as at other times before. You know what Samson was doing? Same thing we do. We think, ah, I'll plow through it. I, I know this is my weakness, but I can overcome it. I can, I, can, I can compensate. And Samson shook himself, said, I'll go out as at other times before. But he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. And if we're not careful, 
one of these days, Satan can get us in a position where we can't compensate him with it. And where all of a sudden, all our attempts and all our, uh, all our, 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 our commitment to try to save our life or, or save our children's lives or, or, or get back on track is going to be in vain because we weren't aware of Satan's devices. So let's think about Peter a little bit this morning because I believe in Peter's life, there are four common tactics that Satan uses against men. First of all, we see that Satan will heighten our fears. He will heighten our fears. Now, I know as men, we say, hey, I ain't afraid of nothing. Well, the truth is, if we were honest, we're all afraid of something. Uh, it's probably different. If you go around this room, say, honestly, now, what, 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 what are you afraid of? Now, I'll be honest with you. I hate snakes. I just don't want to be in the presence of a snake. I know people say, oh, that's not a poisonous snake. Well, I'm not hanging around long enough to find out if it is or isn't. I just see a snake, I'm out. I had an experience as a small boy with a snake, and I, I just, you know, from that point on, I, I just don't trust him. And by the way, the Lord called the devil a serpent, so that settles it right there. I mean, so I don't like snakes. Now, I, I, I was in a home recently where a guy had a whole bunch of pet snakes. I didn't want to hang around all that much, you know. Uh, I just don't like snakes. Everybody has certain fears. Some people are afraid of heights. Some people are afraid of closed-in spaces. Some people aren't real fond of the dark. Uh, some people would fear public speaking. In fact, standing up and speaking in front of a crowd is the number one fear in the world. Uh, uh, death is number three. So some people would rather die than get up and give a speech. So, I mean, everybody has certain fears, right? And the devil knows what they are. And the devil will capitalize on those fears in our life. He will heighten them. Satan will, 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 will bring these fears to the forefront time after time. And I think in Peter's life, he had a fear of not being accepted. I think Peter was vulnerable to giving in to the pressure of his peers. We see it time and time again where Peter failed because he loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. One time the Lord had to say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You remember Peter by the fire. And, and just a, a few moments before, Peter had vehemently said, I'll die with you, but I'll never deny you. I mean, I'll, I, 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 I'll, I'll go to the death for you, Lord. And, and he's wielding a sword there in the Garden of Gethsemane, chopping off Malchus's ear. I mean, he's all in. But a few minutes later, around that fire, when some little girl says, weren't you with, with him? No, I don't, I don't know the man. And a few minutes later, another says, uh, I think I saw you with, with that man. No, I, I, I don't know the man. Finally, someone said, you're one of his disciples. Your speech bereath you. He said, I know not the man. He cursed. You see, Peter was afraid of being accepted by men. I think of the time that Peter was fellowshipping with some Gentile believers. You remember, Peter was the one who was told by God in a vision that the Gentiles could be saved. Up until Acts chapter 10, the, the apostles thought that the message of salvation was only for the Jews. And so they're preaching to the Jews. But in Acts chapter 10, God gives that vision where the sheet comes down and there's these animals in the sheet. And Peter says, yeah, those are clean and those are unclean. We can eat those, we can't eat those. And God says, call nothing unclean. And through that vision, God allows Peter to be the first to realize that the gospel is to go to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Boy, aren't you glad for that? And so Peter starts preaching to the Gentiles, the message of salvation. And they're getting saved. They're getting saved by faith. That's the only way you can get saved. Just like the Jews, the Gentiles were getting saved by faith. And Peter is, is sitting one night after church at Denny's with a bunch of Gentile believers, and they're having a good time. And all of a sudden, some circumcised walked in the restaurant. And when Peter saw those Jews coming in that restaurant, he gets up from the table, and he runs over, and he sits with the Jews. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul said, when I was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. And boy, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall in that conversation? Paul's saying, Peter... Come on, man. 
You were the one that was told the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. What were you thinking? You knew. You got the message right from God. Yet, Peter, you got concerned about Peter instead of God. Do you find yourself in that place sometimes? You know, we're afraid to maybe witness or we're afraid to take a stand in our family for fear that, well, you know, my wife, my kids, you know, some family members, I might kind of upset some things if I really do what's right. We're afraid maybe to tell guys at work that we're a Christian or that we love the Lord or stand up and be that salt that's a little bit of an irritant. We're afraid to do that because we're afraid of what people might think. Afraid to bow our head even in a restaurant and pray for our food because we're afraid somebody might snicker or we're afraid to go knock on a door and tell somebody about Christ because we're afraid of the response. There was this fear of acceptance. And Peter is, 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 is having his fears heightened by Satan. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Way back in Isaiah 41, verse 10, he says, Fear not, I'm with thee. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Why? Because uh, 1 John 4, 18 says there's no fear in love. Because perfect love, there's only one perfect love, that's God. Perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. There's no fear in love. Yet the devil will heighten those fears in our life. Gentlemen, you may not be willing to come up here and say, well, my fear is. But you can tell God about it. You can give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, I, I'm afraid sometimes to lead my wife like I should. Please help me. Lord, I'm afraid to kind of get on my teenage kids sometimes about things I see that, that aren't pleasing to the Lord. And Lord, I, I don't want to lose my kids. I, I, I don't want to make them angry with me. But Lord, I, I have a fear to speak out to them when, when I should as a dad. And Lord, help, the, my, help me with this fear. Uh, Lord, I, I, I'm timid at work. I, I do my job. I love my job, but I'm just afraid. I don't want to rattle the cage there. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to make it hard at work. I, I want to enjoy my work. And so Lord, help me to be the testimony I need to be in spite of my fears. Lord, I'm afraid to go talk to my neighbor. I mean, he is my neighbor. And I, 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 don't, want, I don't want, we have a good relationship. And Lord, I know I should invite him to church. And I, I know I should uh, uh, talk to him about the Lord. But Lord, I'm afraid. Give those fears to the Lord. Because Satan will heighten our fears. But notice secondly, in Peter's life and in ours, he will highlight our faults. Peter, I believe, was impetuous. Peter was the kind of guy that would, uh, would be impulsive. He, he would sometimes speak before he thought, you know, kind of insert mouth, you know, and, uh, 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 or insert foot, you know, into your mouth. You know, he, he was the kind of guy that would, would step before he looked. He would speak before he thought. Peter, Peter was impetuous. He was impulsive, just as he was when the Lord said, Peter, you're going to deny me. No, no way. He was the only disciple that, you know, stood out there and, and, and said, no, no way, Lord. He was the one that would speak first there when Jesus said, one of you shall betray me. Who is it, Lord? You know, who's the betrayer? Peter oftentimes was impetuous or impulsive. He had some faults that Satan often would highlight in his life and bring to the surface is it easy for us to recognize our faults? We hit this hard last night with respect to sin, but guys, we've got to get good at identifying our sins so that we can confess those sins and make them right before the Lord. Because the devil will just uh, make, them, uh, make that a, a pride thing, and all of a sudden pride begins to overtake us, and we, we go around thinking, well, I don't have any faults, or I'm perfect, or I'm a good dad, and I'm, a, I'm the right kind of husband, and I'm, I'm doing fine at church, and, and pride goes before destruction. Jesus told the story of two men that went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and stood and prayed thus with himself. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? He prayed thus with himself. He wasn't praying to God. He's praying thus with himself. I thank thee, O God, I'm like uh, other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. 
I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Boy, he's praying with himself. Jesus said the publican standing afar off would not even lift up so much as eyes unto heaven, but said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, that man went down unto his house justified rather than the other. For he that exalteth himself should be abased, but he that humbleth himself should be exalted. And again, as men, we're, we're expected to have it together. We're expected to be the spiritual leader. We're expected to provide for our family. We're expected to take roles in the church to help the church go forward. And that's what's expected of us. And so when we have some deficiency, when we have some fault, we don't want to admit it. We, we want to talk about all things we're doing right, but we don't want to deal with those things in our life that are wrong. The church of Laodicea fell into that trap, did they not? Well, the church of Laodicea, they thought they were fine. They thought they were great. And Jesus said, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And here was this church that thought all's well. Hey, we're fine. Don't be preaching to me. We're good. And Jesus said, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clean. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see as many as I love. I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you realize here was this church at Laodicea. God had left the building and they didn't even know it. I mean, they thought, hey, church again today. We're doing super. We're awesome. They didn't even realize the Lord wasn't there. Because all they were focused on was all the good things in their life. But Jesus standing outside the door knocking, saying, you know what? If you'd let me in, if you'd let the light in, I could show you where the dirt is. Now, if you turn out all the lights, the room looks really clean. When you turn a little light on, all of a sudden you see what needs to be cleaned up. Jesus said, if I had not come, they'd not had sin. But because I came, now they have no excuse for their sin. And oftentimes, the Lord tries to shine some light in our life. He tries to show us, hey, this isn't going to be good. This isn't going to work out well for you. You need to get this taken care of. And the, the whole time, the devil's saying, yeah, and I'm going to keep you in that fault. I'm going to keep you in that sin. I'm going to keep you in that little secret area of your life, and I'm going to destroy you with it. Peter found out that Satan will... He will heighten your fears. He will highlight your faults. But notice thirdly, he will harass your faith. Now, it's interesting in this passage we chose as our text that the Lord said, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Did you know that the devil knows the Bible pretty well? And the devil knows that as a Christian, we are to walk by faith, not by sight. The devil knows that as a Christian, we're, we're, we're to operate on the basis of faith. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you ate one of those donuts today <laughs> without faith, you ate it as a sinner. In other words, God says, hey, everything we do in our life has to be by faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. So if there's something in our life that's not by faith, then God says we're, we're, we're acting, we're living in a sinful way. Now, Peter had some pretty amazing faith. I mean, really, you think about Peter. When the Lord called him, he, he left his profession. He left his business. He left his boats. He left the, the fishing world. He, he, he stepped away. He had a wife to take care of. He had, he had a family involved here, but yet Peter was willing to take that step as a married man and follow the Lord for three years. And Peter had some pretty amazing faith in his life. I think, I think the most uh, highlighted aspect of Peter's life where we see faith is when one day they were out on the Sea of Galilee Jesus told him to go over to the other side. And so the disciples got in the ship. They start across. Jesus went up somewhere to pray. And they get in that boat, and a storm came up. Remember that? 
And boy, that storm came up fast on that Sea of Galilee as it still does today. And, and that boat was being, being played with like a toy. And those waves were crashing. That water was filling the boat. And these men had been on that sea probably dozens of times where something like that had happened. They knew how to respond. They knew what to do to compensate for the winds and the storm. But that night, nothing was working. And they're in fear. They're, they're about to die. They're going down. And all of a sudden, they see a figure walking on the water. And they're not sure what this is. And they're all trying to figure this out. They hear his voice, but they're thinking, how, how can somebody be out there walking on the water? And, and somebody suggests it's the Lord. And Peter says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me that I come unto thee on the water. <laughs> Here's Peter, open mouth, insert foot, you know. Lord, if it's you, let me walk on this water. In other words, he's asking for proof that it's him. And the Lord said, come. And Peter steps out of that boat. Now, gentlemen, that took some faith. I mean, good night. You ever done that? I don't know anybody in the world who's ever done that. If they have, they didn't get very far. <laughs> we probably never heard them tell the story. You know. And remember, there's a storm going on. This isn't crystal clear uh, water here that he's walking on. You know, the flannel graph story you saw as a kid, you know, you got nice calm water. This, this water <laughs> is raging. I did a little water skiing in my earlier days of life, and I didn't like to go water skiing if the water was choppy. You know, I, I want that nice, smooth as glass water early in the morning. That's when I'm going to go water skiing. You know, get those big rooster tails and all that going. I didn't like that choppy water. I didn't like it a lot of other boats out on the lake, you know. I want that to myself. So think about it. I could see maybe having the faith to step out on some flat, calm water. But this water is raging. It's filling the boat. The waves are crashing. The wind is blowing. The rain is beating down. And Peter says, okay. That took a lot of faith. And we don't know exactly how many steps he took. We think two or three, probably. We, the, the, the words read pretty fast in the account. But he might, he might have taken much more than that. We don't know. But he walks on the water, something that no one else, to my knowledge, has ever done. That took a lot of faith. But we know the story. He sees the wind boisterous and the waves, and he, he, he takes his eyes off the Lord, as we would say, and he begins to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And he said, O ye of little faith. What? <laughs> little faith? That took a lot of faith. Lord, come on now. You're being awful hard on Peter here. Nobody else has ever tried to walk on water, and you're, you're saying, oh, ye of little faith. But I, I got to thinking about that. What did the Lord mean there? Oh, ye of little faith. That took a lot of faith. Well, when the Lord said, oh, ye of little faith, and he says it three times in the Gospels in different situations, and I think if you study all three, you'll come to the same conclusion. The Lord is not talking about the amount or the quantity of faith there. He's talking about the duration of the faith. In other words, it took a lot of faith for Peter to step out of that boat. That took a large quantity of faith to believe that he could do that with God's help. But his faith didn't last very long. He got a few steps, and all of a sudden, he saw the elements, he saw the, the obstacles, and taking his eyes off Christ, his faith withered, and he sunk. I think that's what he meant here in Luke 22, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. See, Peter, you've got faith right now to follow me. I'll die with you. I'll never deny you. You've got faith. But Peter, I'm warning you. I'm praying for you. Because your faith is little, it's immature in the sense that it's not, going to, it's not going to take you all the way in your life for God. Your faith is frail. Your faith is not mature. And, he, and, and the devil loves to harass our faith. I, th I think as men that are part of this church, you know, for you to get saved, that takes faith. 
and, and that's the most important decision you'll ever make by faith, is to trust Christ as your Savior. And thank God, if you're saved, boy, faith has changed your life. And every one of you have taken steps of faith. Maybe it's, maybe it's getting baptized was a huge step of faith. Maybe joining the church as a Baptist was a huge step of faith. Maybe giving in the offering or, and, and beginning to tithe was a huge step of faith. But the devil's going to harass that faith. He's going to harass you. He's going to, he's going to show you some winds. He's going to show you some waves. He's going to show you some things around you that will cause you for your faith to fail. That's why Isaiah said, Thou keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon your God. It's one thing to have faith and, boy, be all excited and step out to serve God. But what about next month? And what about a year from now? And what about five years from now? You know, when you, when you look at people that you admire in the Christian life, you see faith that has longevity, don't you? You see someone that's been faithful for not days, but decades. You see people that have stayed faithful through the thick and the thin, as we would say. Why? Because God says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Gentlemen, let's ask God to elongate our faith. The apostles one day, they said, Lord, increase our faith. Were they asking for more? Well, those men had, had some faith to do what they were doing, probably more than I had. But they were saying, Lord, elongate that faith. And by the way, every one of them that prayed that prayer went to a martyr's death, except for John. God needed their faith to endure, didn't he? And Peter, he learned a lesson here about his faith not failing. He learned a lesson from that bolt experience of faith. Peter learned something because Peter did go all the way to death for the Lord. In fact, uh, Jerome in the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, Jerome the historian says Peter was led to the place of execution and he requested that he be crucified upside down. For he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same manner and form as my Lord. So Jerome states, they crucified Peter, his head downward on the cross and his feet upward. Boy, I guess his faith did increase. His faith did elongate. His faith didn't fail there at that moment of death. Peter, somewhere along the line, got it. And we need to get it because I'm telling you, days like we're in right now will test your faith. You know? We're, we're finding out, maybe the Lord's finding out, who's going to be faithful through this stuff? Who's going to be faithful through a pandemic? Who's going to be faithful when the church has to get uncomfortable and do things that we don't like? And, and who's going to be faithful when, when the rubber meets the road, as we say? I need some people whose faith is elongated, it's strengthened, it's going to endure because Satan will harass your faith. But then I think finally this morning, he'll heighten your fears, he'll highlight your faults, he'll harass your faith, but then he will hinder our focus. Peter does well in learning some of these lessons along the way. And it would seem that as a result of his denial and the Lord's look on him, he goes out, he weeps bitterly. It seems like Peter now is back on track at the resurrection. And uh, Peter is one of those that runs to the empty tomb and sees the risen Christ. And Peter seems to be doing pretty good. But then in John 21, Peter announces in verse 1 or verse 3 there, I go fishing. He said to six other disciples, I'm going fishing. Now, if you said you know, to your wife this afternoon, I'm going to go fishing. Well, you would mean I'm going to take the afternoon. I'm going to get a little, little R&R &R or whatever. I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to get a little recreation. I'm going to go fishing. But that's not what Peter meant. When Peter said, I'm going fishing, he said, I'm going back to where I was before the Lord called me. Because remember, 
God found Peter as a fisherman, and he said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And Peter left all and followed the Lord. But now Peter says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back. In other words, he was saying, I quit. We don't know exactly what the burden was at that moment. We don't know if it was the fact that, that, that there was sort of an anticlimactic thing in his mind about Christ and what had happened in that death, burial, and resurrection. We, we don't understand exactly what Peter's thinking there, but he's saying, I'm, I'm going back. I quit. And the other disciples said, we also go with thee. And so they go out, and they fished all night, and they caught nothing. And when you're running from the Lord, you're not going to be successful. And in the morning, they heard a voice from the shoreline, didn't know who it was, but somebody's yelling out there, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said, cast the net on the right side, and you shall find. And I can see Peter maybe rolling his eyes, thinking, who's this clown, you know? We've been out here all night. We haven't caught anything. And there's no sense throwing these nets out again. But nevertheless, they threw the net over, perhaps to prove him wrong. And suddenly that net was filled with fish, 153. And John says, it's the Lord. Because nobody else could do something like that. It's the Lord. And Peter girded his fisher's coat on him because he was naked. And he jumped in the water and he came to that shore, and the other disciples bringing the boat and the fishes. When they got there, Jesus had already made a fire, had some fish there for breakfast. And after they had dined, Jesus saith unto Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Then feed my lambs. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Lovest thou me? He said, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Then feed my sheep. Now, the Bible is a book. You have to read the Bible. You don't get to watch the Bible. In other words, you don't have to sit down and watch the Bible today. The Bible's not a movie. It's not a video. It's a book. So you've got to read the Bible. But to understand the Bible, you have to sometimes provide your own video, or you won't understand it. You've got to have a little video going in your head when you read the Bible. And this is one of those spots. Because there they are, these disciples and Jesus, sitting around this fire, and Jesus says to Peter, do you love me more than these? Well, if you were there, you would have known exactly what the these are, because these would have been pointing to something. But you don't read that in the Bible. You, you can't see his finger or his hand pointing at something. So you've got to run some video here. So who are the these, or what are the these? When Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Was he, was he pointing to the other disciples? Peter, do you like me more than these guys? Was he pointing to some houses dotting the hillsides of Galilee there? Peter, do you love me more than these houses? What are the these? Well, I don't know what's in your video. Here's what's in mine. I think he's pointing to the fish. The fish on the fire, maybe, that are left over from breakfast, or maybe some of the fish flopping in the nets over on the deck of the boat. I don't know, but he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, I don't think Jesus was asking him, Peter, do you like me more than fried fish? No. What he was asking him was, Peter, do you love me more than what this world has to offer you? Because a few hours before, Peter says, I go fishing. So now Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter said, I'm going back. I'm not going to serve you anymore. I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I quit. And, and God now says, Peter, do you love me more than what this world has to offer you? What was the devil doing? The devil was messing with his focus. Peter had followed the Lord. He had been one of his disciples. He had done the things that Christ had asked. But now the devil had altered his focus. And Jesus said, Peter, 
Get your eyes back over here. You love me. You're going to follow me. Jesus had said in Luke 9, verse 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's interesting. He didn't say no man having put his hand to the plow and going back. All the devil has to do is get our focus. All he has to do is get us to look away. You ever been riding with somebody in a car and you say, hey, look at that. And the guy goes, yeah, that's cool. All of a sudden you're in the ditch because he lost his focus. The devil tries to steal our focus, and if he can get us to look away from the will of God, if he can look, get us to look away from what he wants in our life, he's got us. When Eve saw that the tree was good for food, when Achan saw a Babylonish garment, a wedge of gold, shekels of silver, when Samson saw a woman of Timnath, he said, get her for me, she pleaseth me well. When David saw a woman washing, the rest of the story we know all too well. In all those accounts, and all it took was for Satan to to get their focus off of God and off of God's will and off of God's plan, and that's what he'll do for us. He'll try to hinder our focus. When I was a boy growing up on the farm, the first thing you did in the spring was plow the fields. And that, that meant, you know, we're ready to get going again, you know, and it was an exciting time. You know, the winter had passed, the snow had melted, the ground had dried out, and now it was time to plow. And uh, I always got excited about that, you know, because it starts the season. It starts the whole process. And, 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 but my dad always did the plowing. He wouldn't let me plow. He'd let me do a lot of things with a tractor. I was driving a tractor when I was six years old, driving hay balers and all that kind of stuff as just a little kid. I had, I had to get up out of the seat to stop the tractor. I couldn't reach the clutch from the seat. I had to get up and, and jump on it, you know, to get the tractor to stop. So I had been driving tractors, but, but Dad wouldn't let me plow. And I'd bug him about it. I'd say, Dad, can I plow? Can I plow? And my dad had a favorite expression, we'll see. He'd say, we'll see. That meant table it. <laughs> don't bring it up again. Well, I was about 13, and I was bugging my dad about plowing, and he said, uh, all right. He said, go, go crank up the tractor and hook up the plow. Oh, man. I ran to that shed. I cranked that tractor up and hooked up that little two-bottom plow that we had, pulled it out to the fuel tank there, and dad started pumping gas into that plow or into that tractor and started greasing the fittings on the plow and getting it all squared away and ready to go. And he jumped in the seat, told me to climb up on the fender, and we rode down to a field that was about 20 acres and, and a square, square 20 acre field. He got to the center of that field and he stopped and he said, Now, son, I'm going to let you plow this field, but he said, There's something you, you got you to gotta do. He said, you got to get this first run across the field, this first furrow. It's got to be absolutely straight. Because if it's not, you're going to have little pies left over at the end. You get crooked now, by the time you get to the end, you're going to have these little pies that aren't plowed, and then we can't do anything with that land. We lose that. So we, we got to get this thing straight. How are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. You ever notice that teenagers can say a whole bunch of words with one syllable? I don't know. <laughs> you know. I said, I don't know. He said, climb up in that seat. I got up in the seat. He said, now, I'm going to give you some instruction. He said, I want you to look out across the tractor. What do you see? Nothing. <laughs> and I didn't see anything. It was just a field, you know, a bunch of old dead corn stalks from last year and trash blowing across. And he said, what do you see? I said, nothing. He said, look harder. What do you see? I said, Dad, just more of the same. I don't, I don't see anything. He said, well, look way to the end of the field. What do you see? A fence. Good. He said, pick out a fence post. I said, okay, got it. He said, now, I'm going to keep talking. But he said, don't take your eyes off that fence post. Now, with your eyes on that fence post, I want you to push in the clutch. I pushed into the clutch. He said, now, without taking your eyes off that fence post, reach down and start the tractor. Yes, sir. Start the tractor. He said, now, without taking your eyes off that fence post, put the tractor in gear. 
I put it in gear. He said, now you're going to start easing off that clutch, but don't take your eyes off that fence post. You're going to start moving forward. He said, when you start moving forward, reach back, but don't take your eyes off the fence post and grab the rope and trip the plow. He said, you go across this field, you never take your eyes off that fence post. If the dog barks, don't look at him. If a bird flies over your head, don't look at it. If the neighbor goes by and honks his horn, don't look at him. Keep your eyes on that fence post. You got it? I said, yes, sir. He said, go. So, boy, I cranked that tractor up, and I put that thing in gear, and I started forward, and I reached back, tripped that plow, and I went across that field, and the dog did bark, but I didn't look at him. A couple birds flew overhead. I didn't look at him. Neighbor went by twice, honked his horn. I didn't look at him. I got all the way across that field. And I turned that tractor around, and I looked back, and that furrow was absolutely straight. And my dad was standing in the furrow, and he went like this. And he walked back to the barn. <laughs> I learned something that day. you got to keep your focus. And too many guys in this world today, in our churches, oh, they're fine Sunday morning. And they're fine kind of, you know, when game time comes. But what about when the devil is harassing that faith? Or what about when the devil is trying to fool with your focus? Are you taking your eyes off the Lord? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. I don't know what the these are in your life. Probably different for all of us. But do you love me more than these? Satan is our enemy. And Satan will try to heighten our fears. He'll try to highlight our faults. He'll try to harass our faith, and he'll try to hinder our focus. Zechariah said, I saw Joshua, the high priest, standing at the altar, and Satan standing at his right hand, ready to resist him. Gentlemen, every time your pastor stands in this pulpit to preach, Satan's standing right here, ready to resist him. But it's no different for you. When you go home and try to lead your family and, and, and lead your wife in the relationships you're trying to have, Satan's sitting on the couch, ready to resist you. When you get, get to that workplace and you try to be that testimony and you try to witness for the Lord, Satan's right there at your, your desk or your machine, ready to resist you. He's our enemy, and we better study the defense because if we don't know they're in a cover too, and we try to throw a deep pass, it's probably going to get intercepted. We got to know the defense, and today, let's learn some things about our enemy, and then let's come back to this book, the book of wisdom, yeah. and say, okay, God, help me to walk in the way that you'd have me to walk. Let's pray together. And as we bow for just a minute, What's the area of vulnerability for you? Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's your focus. Maybe it's a particular sin that just is that besetting sin, that fault that just keeps coming back again and again and again. Maybe it has something to do with your faith. You've started strong, you've done well, but boy, it just you're getting weary and well-doing. And your faith is, is not elongated as it should. The Lord could be speaking in numbers of different ways, but wherever he's putting his finger first, would you just talk to him about that right now? Brother Brian will begin to play, and as he does, just talk to the Lord. We're not asking you to confess your sins to us, the pastor. Oh, we'd be glad to help, try to encourage you, but you got to talk to the Lord. Lord, here's where I'm weak. Here's where I always stumble. Here's where I always mess up. And ask the Lord to give you strength in that area. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. And your most identifiable weakness today could become your strength if you give it to the Lord. The very thing that you struggle with today could one day be your strength. I don't think Peter was worried about what people thought of him as he asked to be crucified upside down. I don't think he was worried about any more the peer pressure around him. He didn't care. At that point, he was willing to die for the Lord because he realized the enemy and he found out where the devil would attack. 
And time after time in his first and second letter of Peter, he encouraged those Christians that were under a tremendous attack to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to continue. And that's what we need to pray today. Lord, I don't know if the devil has had a more imposing defense against Christianity since the first century that he does today. Lord, there is a, a wall of defense against your people. And yet, thank you, Lord, that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Lord, we have victory on our side. We have the power of Jesus Christ himself who said, that he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So thank you for those promises that, that assure us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, we've got to play the game. We've got to participate. We've got to get in the battle. And so Lord, as we wrestle with this unseen enemy day after day after day as men, I pray, Lord, that we would take these lessons we can learn from those that have gone before us, like Peter, Say, Lord, that's where I need your strength. That's where I need your help. And thank you, Lord, that you've promised to give it to us. And we can be victorious in our lives, in our families, in this church, in this community. And we'll give you all the glory for those victories. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor.